Fun Ideas Productions presents the Fun Ideas Podcast. We see the syphilitic shrinking obelisk. The white man's wilting dick. of CD game show trolls The smiling lie of the televised Hi, this is Mark Arnold, and welcome to Fun Ideas Podcast number 43. This episode is sponsored by the fine folks at Lee's Comics. Hi, I'm George Takei. You know me as Helmsman Sulu on Star Trek. When I'm not busy going Warp Factor 8, I like to beam down to Lee's Comics in Mountain View and spend a lazy afternoon reading comics classics from Marvel to DC, from Dark Horse to Fantagraphics, and everything in between. So please, spend some time here at Lee's Comics and spend your hard-earned cash. <coughs> The Fun Ideas Podcast is made possible by listeners like you and from Lee's Comics of California, selling you what your mother threw out since 1982, online at leescomics.com. Alvin, the story of Ross Bagdasarian Sr., Liberty Records, Format Films, and The Alvin Show is out. Order your hardback, paperback, and ebook copies today on Amazon and at bearmannermedia.com. The Warren Kremer, TTV Scrapbook, and Monkey Solo Books are in various stages of completion, so I have taken on a new project that currently has no official title, but it is a history of Mad Magazine. I avoided doing a Mad History book for years, figuring that it had already been done and done well, when I realized that a complete Mad History had never been done since the early 1990s. So, I'm taking it upon myself to start that book. The Kickstarter for the Comedy of Jack Davis and the Comedy of John Severin was wildly successful, and we will be shipping the books and the other goodies during the month of October. Our guest today has been a writer for San Jose's Metro newspaper since 1985 and is a widely respected movie critic. Here he is, Richard Von Busek. Okay, on the phone today I have Richard Von Busek, and he has been a writer for San Jose's Metro newspaper since 1985, and right, yeah. I was curious, because I've read your material since the beginning, how did you get that gig? <laughs> well, it's like this, I'm, um, I was a college newspaper writer, I, uh, I worked for City on Hill, the uh, college paper at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, I was the editor, 82, 83, and I had a column um, under a pseudonym that it went over well. It was like, uh, it was well received. So um, I knew Dan Polcrano, the publisher of, uh, you know, he was the publisher of, oh God, what was it called? Leviathan, which was like a Jewish student's uh, quarterly newspaper. Oh, okay. And uh, so he'd, he'd been reading me. And uh, then when he started up, um, he was in San Jose. He was coming down there in the project to start a weekly paper in San Jose. And I just did not see it. He was going this is going to be, you know, this is going to be a major city. And I was looking around and, and I just thought, uh, yeah, in a million years, you know, I, I just <laughs> did not, I did not see it coming. I was just totally flummoxed by this, this prospect. They were just putting in the light rail. The streets were all full of mud. It was, you know, I just, you know, <laughs> uh, it always, it, I mean, uh, I think, yeah, San Jose at that point always seemed like kind of a negative land to me. And I didn't have a car at those days. So I came down on the bus from San Francisco and it just I, I mean just covering it <laughs> uh, covering it from like the Santa Cruz Road to, to downtown to catch the bus back up to, it was just it was you know I, I just didn't see it but he was right he was right and uh, you know it just the, the city popped up around all the money poured in like a tidal wave and uh, Metro just you know kept bopping along until the 1990s when it was just you know ginormous 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's still so, yeah. it, it's still around now, right? Uh, on a regular oh, yeah. weekly basis. I thought it was. Yeah, I don't, oh, yeah. Obviously, I don't live there anymore, but I think I picked up an issue right. when I was down there. Um, I saw you recently at the Silicon Valley Comic Con. Uh, were you covering that for uh, Metro, or are you doing just your oh. own thing? Or both? Oh yeah, no, I was. I mean, when I got there, I didn't have to cover it. I was, I was just, I did like a lot of previews for it. I, you know, interviewed Adam Savage and uh, uh, J.P. Scott. I think his name is the uh, one of the guys that's like trying to figure out a way to get us back to the moon. <laughs> um, yeah, I just did like I did like a lot of. Uh, I didn't. I actually did a long think piece on Nancy um, because uh, Gilchrist, uh, Todd Gilchrist, was going to be there. One of the guys, the guy that had been like drawing it for twenty years or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah. So I, was, uh, I, I do love comics. I like to come in whenever I whenever I can. I'm not really as conversant. I had a comics column for a while, and I really enjoyed being able to write about comics. And uh, there was like this kind of lull in the action where it just didn't seem like anything was being published that I wanted to write about. And <laughs> I, was, I was kind of warned you lose this space if you don't come up with something, you know. So. Yeah. So roughly, no, no, no. when did that yeah, column no. run? I mean, I, I've read Metro on and off, and I don't remember dates of when columns ran. <laughs> so uh, it was in the 1990s, also okay. in the 1990s. So that's when yeah. we that's when we really had the most expansive. You know, the, right. that was really the, the top of the parabola. You know, um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, I wrote about all kinds of stuff. I, I wrote an article about uh, Jimmy Corrigan, and the smartest boy on earth, that I really like, and uh, I know that that. that um, Chris Ware liked it too and uh, I remember like having fun writing about Jimmy Olsen back when you could get like ratty old Jimmy Olsen oh, yeah. comics for like a you know three for a dollar and I just you know I love the bizarre still do I mean that's like that's one thing I have a collection of is Jimmy Olsen comics mm-hmm. Jimmy Olsen Superman's pal because they're just so bizarre and they're so often about like Jimmy trying to kill or humiliate Superman right <laughs> and, and you, just re- you just get the uh, the sense with these guys they were doing it just like they'd had you know Superman was on their last nerve and yet they had to keep drawing him <laughs> <laughs> that's true like, figure out just like, like, like stuff just to, like throw stumbling blocks under his mighty red booted feet you know so yeah because I, I do love Superman of course so you know I'm pretty sentimental about it but I also like watching these insane things that are like you know stream of inebriated stream of consciousness yeah I mean the, the pathway between It seems like they always had that, and I never really thought about this until you just said this. It's like, you know, they, they kind of use Jimmy Olsen title as an outlet for people who are sick of just writing straight Superman adventures. Seems like uh, Lois Lane was also set up that way, and then all the oh, yeah. various super horse and other characters that they had just to kind of say, all right. The, the cat, yeah. My, uh, my friend Rebecca Wright, like, uh, she, she she did her, her thesis on, on Lois Lane comics because they were just, you know, so so bizarre, so, you know, like like in their way, kind of proto feminist at times, and other times just you know, just plain lunatic. Yes. You know, <laughs> they did like a black like me episode, just like that that book by um, oh god, John Howard Lawson, I think his name was the guy that like took the melanin treatments and uh, and, and and passed for African American. <laughs> wrote about it in the sixties, and uh, so he did that to Lois too. <laughs> yeah, it's just. Just amazing. You, you, you see the uh, covers of those. I know that the people think the action was with Marvel, and yeah. my problem was when I was a young kid reading them, uh, is I lived out in the sticks, and I did not have a really good source for um, for Marvel. Like you know, and, and there was there were continuing stories, and you had to know what was going on in the previous issue, and you know the way that Stan Lee would platform a story, right? You kind of coast it back and forth. So I was lost. But DC starts and begins same as you, you know. So <laughs> yeah, it's it funny. We're simple minded, but it's like you, you, your story's right there. Right, right. Now I'm a few years younger than you, but when I started reading, mainly is like in the mid '70s, and uh, Marvel was king, but. Uh, I'd read my share of Superman and other stories, but by the time I started, you know, all that Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen stuff was combined into Superman family, and I said, what's all right. this? You know, so I didn't get it until years later, and then I started buying back issues because, yeah, these are quirky and weird, you know. I, of course, I had to get the Jimmy Olsen one where he wants to be a beetle, you know, the thousand-year-old Oh, she has the red-headed beetle of Krypton, that one. <laughs> it's like a secret 
agent, and uh, it wasn't until later that you really started to uh, started to try to kill Superman. Right. Were those <laughs> the... Was, like trying to make him cry, <laughs> like showing him films of Krypton. <laughs> he destroyed that. <laughs> somebody, somebody presumably took, I don't know how they filmed it, but... <laughs> were were <laughs> like, those the you know, Jack Kirby issues, or was that even before that? That was, that was before Jack Kirby. Okay, okay, okay that's what I thought. Jack Kirby... You know, as much as I love King Kirby, this, this, when he took over, that was kind of a deal breaker just because I, I'm kind of allergic to, like, you know, these boys and, you know, kids with doibies, you know, talking like this. <laughs> but Not a, he did have his share of the, you know, like the Don Rickles issues and things like that, so he had his, his is share true. of craziness, yeah. which I, to this day, I've never gotten a solid answer if he was a close friend with him or he just admired him or whatever. I've heard differing opinions of why they would put Don Rickles on there at that time. Cause well, I think they, they were in different theaters of war. I think wasn't wasn't Kirby was like in Europe, and I think Rickles was in the South Pacific. So I don't know if they met during the during the big war or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, you can see they they would have a lot in common, right? You know, so so they they may well. I don't know. We'll, we'll get to the bottom of this someday. This is right. a very interesting. Puzzle. But I, but I have heard oh. Rickles in later years. You know, if you approached him with one of those comic books, he was like. It was like kryptonite to him. He's like, keep those away from me. I don't want to see those. You know, and I don't know if he's joking or not, you know, but, well, you know. You know, the, the Goody Rickles thing may have been too much for him. Maybe the deal breaker. You have, like, the, the twin that's the identical twin that's, like, you know, maybe that's what would bug him. I don't know. But, you know, you know who would know about this stuff, I bet, is Scott Shaw. We should ask yeah, him. Yeah, that's true. I, I know him, too, so I, I could give Scott a, a – well, yeah. I'm trying to get him on the podcast. He said he'd do it, but I, I haven't got, I got him nailed down yet. But I know during the last – months, you know, he does a lot of conventions, of course, like San Diego oh, yeah. and everything else. Yeah, he lives at this stuff, yeah. Yeah, I don't know him personally, just know him through via Facebook. I mean, I, I may have seen mm-hmm. him. I think I, I used to have his calendar, which I loved. Mm-hmm. He put out a calendar, and also, I'm just going back to the mid-90s again, um, <laughs> that, that, that calendar that he put out that had the, uh, it, each, it was like each day was like some bad comic book from his oh, yeah, yeah. You see that slideshow yeah. of, of just like really bizarre stuff. This is the kind of, the, which, you know, that's one of the things I love about comics, the ones that you just, where the retinal, the, the you know, optic nerve takes it in and the brain goes, nope, 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 I'm not going to believe it. No, sir, nope, nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy that I've gotten Scott to, like, a few oddball comics over the years. Like, one I remember finding for him is uh, a Dennis the Menace uh, comic book where he's feeding Ruff the dog boners, you know, and it just looked funny, you know. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, everybody was the famous, the famous Joker, uh, you know, <laughs> he was like, ah, I will show Batman, I will, you know, I will, I will pull the biggest boner ever, you know, like that. And, <laughs> Everybody's like, oh dear. And it, and it's funny, it's like when you say, Scott, I found an oddball comic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen them all before. No, I I, I discovered oh, one that you hadn't seen. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so that that's, was that that's one. That's a serious achievement. That's, yeah. that's really something. <laughs> and I yeah, thought no, for he, sure he might have seen it too, but I figured I'd show it to him. And yeah, he was impressed. So he said, Can I make uh, a copy of that? Right. You know. <laughs> That's that's an achievement. Yeah, it's like stuffing Jerry back with like some, you know, like get a load of this. You know, they only had it in one regional market. It's like some stuff that makes Sam Singer look like like one of the, you know, the nine old men or something. Just bad, bad animation. I, I went to that. My, my wife was like, Pee. she did not have a good time. Uh, but we went to go see uh, one of the Dumpster Bright and um, Jeff, uh, Jerry Beck uh, shows of like bad cartoons at oh, yeah. Steve Allen's theater. Mm-hmm. In Hollywood, and I was just like, I was happy, and yet TV's Frank was there, like on the coast. <laughs> I was like, wow, these are some bad cartoons. You know, this Patty the Pelican from Chicago in the right. 50s, and you see it on YouTube, and you just go, oh, lordy, you know? Yeah. And I get it, and you get it. I could see if you if if you are not a cartoon fan, or you're not a true bad cartoon fan, you'd say, "This is just yeah, bad. I don't get it." You know, it's like, this? "What am I watching this you know, for?" Yeah, exactly. But, it, it's just... it, but it's so bad, it's good. I mean, uh, Jerry has admitted on other shows, and to me personally, yeah, uh, I don't show truly bad stuff that's just uh, it, unwatchable. You know, it'd have to have some sort of bizarre appeal to it. You know, and it it does. Yeah. You know, like what was the one he has? Uh, is it? T Man or Titanium Man or I can't remember. Oh yeah, it. that's it. The action Titan or whatever. Titan, like, Titan. Exercises. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fairly animated. <laughs> and his <laughs> arms are like longer than his legs when he does his exercises. Time for Titan and all that stuff. It's like, whoa, where did you get this stuff, Jerry? <laughs> yeah. I thought I had bizarre stuff, but you know. Oh no, I remember that one. I yeah. remember they they did broadcast it. They had this, uh, you know, like like uh, the lower 
Watt television stations would, would broadcast this stuff. Oh, you know, I was at the, uh, the Coliseum yesterday, actually two days ago, mm-hmm. and they were doing that thing with the flapping disembodied lips on the blank cartoon faces. So, like Clutch Cargo? Like, like yeah, that? exactly. I was just, like, yelping. I was like, going, God, look at this, look at this. They're doing the Clutch Cargo thing. And I said, yeah, yeah, what are going on about now? Uh, you know my favorite Clutch Cargo story? I mean, the way they get the effect is pretty simple. You take a cone of black paper, and you put it over this guy's mouth, and then you film it, and the lips look disembodied. Right. And so that's how they do the titles to uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Right. So um, they do this. Uh, yeah, so they did this on, the, on like Clutch Cargo. There was like something else called Space Angel, I think, that had yeah. these just blank billboard faces with these writhing pink lips mm-hmm. moving and saying the dialogue. And, it's, and the, yeah, it, Tarantino loved it too. He put it in Pulp Fiction. Right. You can see it, like the kids, the young Christopher Walken, I mean, the young character that Bruce Willis plays. Right, and I just rewatched it, so yeah, I saw that scene. So I go, hey, yeah. Clutch Cargo. I just told my Clutch girlfriend Cargo, about it. My girlfriend did not know anything about it because she's a bit younger than me. And it's like, oh yeah, this crap was shown all the time when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. It was totally. It was all the time. It was on just, just I mean, taking minimalist oh. animation to a new to a new minimum. But here's the, here's, did you ever hear this story that, that you know, somebody, you're, you're mocking Clutch Cargo and laughing. Right. right, and then there'll be somebody in the room that goes, "Well, you know the story of that, don't you?" <laughs> the producer, the producer's child, he was born deaf. She yeah. was, she was born deaf. She wanted to watch cartoons, but she couldn't. She didn't know what the soundtracks were saying. So he made this specially for his little daughter, so she could she could follow the cartoon right. along and read the lips. <laughs> and you're laughing, you're laughing at that like it's a joke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm laughing at that. Uh, true. All right, it's this is true. this it is. Just, is like, Oh, that was a lie. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's a lie. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know one way or the other. So when you're telling me, I was like, "Oh, that's too bad." But I was laughing as a kid of grown men wearing lipstick, so his lip shows I up. But... <laughs> I think they had to put lipstick on him to get it. To get yes. The image so, to read. I mean, nowadays that's commonplace. But you got to remember, I'm talking early '70s. You know, it's like guys with lipstick. You'd go, "Whoa!" You know, it's like yeah. Uh, <laughs> What's with all this? Especially Clutch and yeah. and, uh, and Paddle. But no, Spinner was the boy, and Paddlehead was the dog. Anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you've been to Jerry's uh, worst cartoon show, then you may have seen the one. It's called Synchrovox. That's what they called that. Um, the one Synchrovox yeah, that didn't. Thank you. The one Synchrovox show that didn't sell, but he shows it. There was a pilot made of Moon Mullins, the old newspaper comic strip. Oh no. <laughs> But I mean, you know, Moon Mullins is just like a little pen and ink strip, and it's like here they have these like three dimensional paintings of guys with derbies, and it's like, mm, you know, <laughs> it's kind of it, it, it kind of vaguely looks like Moon Mullins, but it's like, you know, that's taking some liberties with that, <laughs> you know? and of course it has the big red lips that speak, <laughs> so you're like, ooh, yeah. So next time you see Jerry Beck's show, hopefully you'll show that if you haven't seen it before, it's oh, really creepy. <laughs> come up here and do more shows. Yeah, I've asked him to, yeah. but, you know, it's like he's yeah, teaching he's, in L.A., and I know, you know, he's busy, 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 but, you know. <laughs> he's got the good cycle. He's got the, uh, my old movie theater when I was a little, little kid, the Alex in Glendale, beautiful yeah. old theater. You go there and also to El Segundo, uh, which Red Fox always tried and failed to make as much of a punchline as, like, Anaheim and Aziza Kamongo as for Bob Hope, but, mm-hmm. but he's got some other theater out there, too, so. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, I've good, I've put uh, Jerry in touch with both the Castro Theater and the um, Stanford the Theater. Stanford Theater. Oh yeah, the Stanford. That would be great. I don't. I just. I can't see it happening in the Stanford. I, I know. <laughs> we go back to the Roxy or something like that. But, yeah. You know, but we'll hard. see. You know, I, I don't know how ambitious he is because then he has to, you know, schlep all the way up to Northern California when you know, hey, yeah, I, I got right. good gigs down yeah. here because he is uh, working directly with Tarantino since you mentioned him on his movie theater with like a, a Saturday matinee show that he shows old cartoons and stuff like that that I've heard recently. So, you know, he has his plate kind of full. <laughs> so. I get it you know yeah as a Los, as a Los Angelian I was, you know, I was raised there and stuff and mm-hmm. uh, yeah I'm really pleased with the way the place is coming along mm-hmm. how they're starting to preserve a lot of the stuff they used to knock over and now they've got a transit system you know I mean it's still absolutely impossible to get from one end to the other but <laughs> um, and then and then the places like the New Beverly which is just great I mean, it makes me so happy that the place is just bustling that there's like there's like people that literally want to line up around the block to see something like the Wrecking Crew you know mm-hmm. And it's, it's not, it's like the, 
yeah, it's the second worst Matt Hell movie, but yeah, they want to be in a screen 35 millimeter, you know, it's like, great. Yeah, Phil Carson, you know, go in there and rhapsodize about the, the genius of Phil Carlson, you know, mm-hmm. which is not really in display in that movie. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's not the Phoenix City story, kids, you know, mm-hmm. but it's, it's it's very satisfying. It's it's really nice, and it remind, it, I really do believe in that Freudian thing about how uh, what the, the son wishes to forget, the grandchild wishes to remember, you know. Mm-hmm. So so we're getting the grandchildren now, and they're, they're coming around, they want to see all this, this uh crazy 60s 5 movie track it's great right um well let's go back to you for a second is uh sure uh, you grew up or was born in San Bernardino California is that correct that's correct okay and then terrible uh it's hot that's all I think of when I think of that uh but uh you know tell us about uh how you grew up and how you got interested in writing and movies and comics and everything oh sure sure okay so um that's kind of a reject. Uh, had asthma, oh, yeah. so it's no, no interest. You know, zero interest in sports. You know, when I was a little boy, um, I was on a lot of asthma drugs, so I talked too much. And I really, you know, the more, I, the older I get, the more I realize what it must have looked like. You know, um, uh, but uh, but I had a pretty easy time of it in school because um, I just kind of went from one hippie school to another. <laughs> they were doing like alternative schools. Um, in first in Eagle Rock, like elementary school, fifth and sixth grade, I get to to like you know go to school with like other peaceful nebishes. <laughs> and then junior high school, we had this like little the learning center kind of set apart. And then I went to Area D High School, and uh, it was just like an alternative school. So I really I bypassed a lot of bullying. Hmm. I got you know a little a little bit of it, but I didn't really get it in the face the way lots of kids that were as like weird and uh, wordy and like you know given to just wanting to just sit around and read, do nothing. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it, it's, divorce is not like a, it's not an unusual thing down there. And uh, actually, with my parents, the deal was that I think I saw some auto premature melodrama about a couple that had to get married because uh, she was pregnant. And the instant I saw it, I think seven or eight, I realized, oh, so that's how those two got together. Uh. <laughs> it, was just, it was like it was like somebody just took a donkey, you know, like a hardworking donkey and a prancing circus pony, and you know. But so, but as a result, my mom, my mom was a very frivolous person and just she loved to party and and just you know leave her kids alone and stuff like that. Uh. But she loved movies. She was a movie fiend. Uh. She knew a good one from a bad one, and. Uh, and she was, you know, she'd take me to stuff. I mean, I, as a result, I saw stuff that was like kind of, as they say, age inappropriate. It seemed like MASH and Godfather and, uh, you know, at a really young age. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I got a lot of shocks. <laughs> what did you, you think of those at those ages? I was just like shocked. I was like, you know, the execution of uh, the, the guy that gets garroted in The Godfather, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah, and he's just like dies staring straight at us. There was that was shocking. The, the blood and mash, the uh, help the bomb at your scene in Catch Twenty Two. You know the, the um, <laughs> yeah. It's just like it was. It was like a real. It was a shocking time. And and, and uh, <laughs> but at the, the, the same time, I mean, and I did. You know, I would go to see stuff. They yeah. had revival houses, and I would go on the bus to like go to the New Vagabond and, and Wilshire Boulevard and see like uh, on the waterfront. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, it was 50 years ago. This January 1st is the one that really just I was thunderstruck by. And it's not even a, it, it, perhaps it's not one of the greats of the greats. But but when I saw Under Majesty's Secret Service on January 1st, oh, 1970, yeah. Yeah. the Academy Theater, that was that was it for me. I'd never seen anything like that. <laughs> you know, I really I was like age 12, and I just never seen a movie that was uh, that was made like that. That was that big. Mm-hmm. Um, there's all. I mean, they're thinking about it for years, uh, and why I love it so much. Now <laughs> uh, the 50th anniversary is coming up. But did it bother just, you like, that Sean Connery wasn't James Bond, or that was not the not point? Not at all. Oh, okay. Not uh-huh. at all. You know, they, the the broccoli's always say that you know whoever you see first, that's your James Bond, right? Oh. No. <laughs> so I don't like any other James Bond movie. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, well, I was I was in for a I was in for a real fondue pot, and I didn't know it. Um, yeah. Because I was, but I was just really moved by it, and the uh-huh. uh, the color, with, you know, that day for night photography, and the and the, the fantastic stunts. Yeah, the guy lost the leg filming, and uh, uh, also uh, most recently, you know, I've been analyzing this over the years, and and uh, the fact that Lazenby isn't really up to it is actually part of the appeal because it's good to have a bond that's overwhelmed. You know? <laughs> I mean, and that's the one where uh, not, up until the Daniel Craig days, you never saw him where he was just like the scene at the skating rink where he's just like, I give up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he sits down there and 
and just waits for the end. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, so the really, you know, existential stuff going on and, and the music was, you know, I just, I just really, I just, I came out of there with eyes like saucers. And, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh one, one thing, recently I was reading about Simon Raven, who I'd never heard about. Um, he's, he's got an additional dialogue credit. Notorious figure in uh, British letters, uh, um, real, you know, real decadent, famous for like uh, his, his illegitimate, the mother of his illegitimate child was asking for money, and he sent her back a cable that said like, "No money, eat baby," you know. <laughs> He was like, so he's the one I think that really gave it the polish that none of the other Bond films quite have. Yeah, you know, and and uh, just in the in the dialogue and who made who elevated Blofeld. So anyway, I could go on and on yeah. about it. That's the fiftieth anniversary, but that was yeah. that's what really got me into more systematic movie watching and studying because I had to find out all the, all the right right when the Bond phenomenon was over is when I got into it. So, right. Uh, yeah, but uh, but I've heard more than one person, and it is up there as one of my favorites. Is that it is everyone's favorite film, you know, which is kind of surprising because it has yeah. the James Bond that was in there once. You know, even Timothy Dalton did a second one, so it's like. Right. <laughs> but uh, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just that uh, yeah. you know, and I didn't see it till years later. My first uh, Bond film, I have to say, and so it's a favorite. But everybody's uh, oh. who's older hates his Moonraker. <laughs> Just ten years later. Wow. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it does have. It does. It's got points. It's got. It's, yeah. it's very beautifully photographed, and it's got. Uh, um, it does have a big cosmic ending and stuff like that. Yeah. And you know, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think that's the worst of them. But you yeah. Know. <laughs> but uh, but on, uh, going back to Honor Majesty's Secret Service, I actually kind of avoided it because I said, oh, if they're in, this is just my own prejudices or whatever. It's just, oh, it must not be good. That guy only did one Bond film. It just must suck. And then I saw it and I go, wow, this is better than most of the Connery ones. You know, <laughs> what's what yeah. wrong with me? You know, and well, everybody, everybody kind of avoids it because they heard Lazen be the stick. You know, and yeah. Um, Actually, I had seen a couple of before, but they hadn't made huge impressions on me. I yeah. didn't really understand them as the truth of it at yeah. that age. I was, uh, you know, I, I didn't understand why he always wanted to take naps because I hated taking one. <laughs> but there was, you know, there'd be like some girl and it's like nap time, and I'm going like, why do you want to go to bed now? <laughs> I, was, I didn't get it at all. So, <laughs> so they kept puzzling. They kept puzzling me when I, I, I you know, we'd go to see like. Yeah. You know, my mom would like like get us to the theater, and it's like whatever's playing there, you go. Yeah, and, I, mean, I saw ones before I saw Moonraker, but they're all on TV, so I count Moonraker as the first one yeah. I saw in the theater. You know, so yeah. <laughs> that makes a difference. Yeah, yeah so more I, was, I, I, had, I had trouble with the the '70s Bonds, and I didn't even actually go see Moonraker in the theater. That was like the first one I think that yeah. I didn't go to. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, just they were. <laughs> it's it's. It's Guy Hamilton. Guy Hamilton's got a chase, taste for cheese, you yeah. know, and, and, um, and they just, yeah, the mid-70s stuff, and they're yeah. just like going, you know, these memories of these of that wonderful music and the ski chases and yeah. just uh, the great, the, the brilliant idea, like, you know, all yeah. that stuff, Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm not defend, I'm not defending Moonraker as the best Bond. It you know for me it's up there for a different reason. It was you know it was at a time you know I, I, when Star Wars came out the original one it was like I was ten so I was a perfect age for that. So anything that is remotely like Star Wars I was like drool drool oh, have to see. So I was seeing Black Hole which is now kind of uh, you know Star Trek the motion picture which is kind of like uh, you know it's like you know Moonraker which is kind of uh, you know but I went and saw all this stuff because you know I wanted that, all that stuff and it all came out between Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back that little three year period where they're just tr throwing everything out there seeing what would stick <laughs> yeah, so. yes yes they were every every kind of space movie they all like Battle Beyond the Stars and stuff right. like that and I'd see them all I was, you know but uh, now when you were seeing things like Godfather I was since I was younger is like I was seeing like all the Disney stuff and anything animated uh -huh. that came oh, down yeah, the pike no. so I was like oh, yeah. in Disney no. heaven you know watching Million Dollar duck and you know <laughs> uh, the know, apple dumpling gang and all that stuff you know right. <laughs> so now did you did you see cart. did you see stuff like that yourself or did you by oh. that point you're like that i'm kid oh, stuff no i was i loved it you know we were living in los angeles and it, it's 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 a different experience with disneyland when you can basically go once a year you know mm -hmm. And did not bankrupt the family, and and uh, so, so no, I, and I loved Uncle Walt on TV, and my no, my parents took 
me out to. I don't know if that's me. I don't think it is. You still there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. Sorry. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, no, I, I, I loved. I was Uncle Walt's little little boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, he didn't watch. Like, I remember begging my father to take me to see the loved one, and he, you know, he's okay. not. The movie, his idea of a movie was like a service comedy, you know. Right. So, um, yeah, that and, and, and uh, Jungle Book. I was mm-hmm. delighted to see that. Um, just, uh, yeah, yeah. It was. No, I, I, I loved Disney. I loved all that stuff. So you, pre- you, know? you pretty much saw everything then back in those days. Whatever came That's out. Exactly what it was like, yeah. Okay. You know, we, we went and saw everything. We, you know, went to bargain matinees. You know, mm-hmm. when I was out sick with the asthma and stuff like that, taken out. It was great. So you know, how I, often did you go to the movie every time during the week? Oh, probably twice or three times a week. Oh, wow. Say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lot. And then uh, we, are, we had a house fire, and mm-hmm. uh, the rest of my the rest of my siblings went to go stay in Oklahoma, and I stayed put mm. to finish junior high school. And then I, then we were staying, the insurance company put us up in a motel, and uh, my mother and I, and we were like on Colorado Boulevard. And, and that's meant, like, suddenly an access to just, like, tons more theaters in Hollywood and mm. Glendale and Pasadena. I could take the bus in a way that was a little tougher before. Mm-hmm. So that's when, yeah, this is, like, 1972. I, I must have seen everything that came out. <laughs> deep, you know, I mean, deep, I, deep throat? <laughs> no. I, I, I can remember that, but, like, one of my, my first high school girlfriends, uh, wealthy friends, had a Betamax and she lived in Beverly Hills, and they had deep throat. And I was like, oh, no. oh, we have to see this, we have to see this, we have to see this. And they were like, uh, no, no, it's really boring, it's really ugly, you know. Like, <laughs> but actually, no, I did I did get to, um, so so my friend Wiley's sister, yeah. uh, she she had a boyfriend that worked as a projectionist of the Pussycat in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we did we did get to go in and, and see, like, you know, see the 35-millimeter <laughs> smut. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it was great, actually. Now, is there any genre you really didn't like or go see very often back then? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm really allergic to home invasion movies. Um, <laughs> I, get, I get manipulated very easily with that the thought of that stuff, and uh-huh. I just, you know, and Rape Revenge, too. It's just like basically, yeah, okay, I'm prepared. All right, you know, I want the bloody vengeance. I don't have to sit here and think, how can I, a liberal countenance, bloody vengeance? You know, it's, it's just like photos on a screen. Let's see it. Let's, you know, let's go. <laughs> I, I just get impatient waiting for the the mayhem or something, and I don't even like it that much. Mm-hmm. So, um, I didn't, let's see. It, the 70s, early 70s, is like, like Pauline Kael's kind of gone on about this in, in re uh, Cleopatra Jones, The Casino of Gold. Mm-hmm. Um, there weren't a lot of his, heroic figures. When you're at an age, you're like, you know, early adolescence, you want to see heroes. Yeah. And uh, that's not what the early 70s did. And I can remember, like, going to see Long Goodbye and being really disappointed and, and angry at what Altman did to Philip Marlowe, you know? Because mm-hmm. I always thought he was like this appreciate westerns at all when i was a kid i thought you know granted this is early 70s so i thought like gun smoke was dreadful i was like why would anybody yeah, watch this crap you know and i didn't realize until a few years later when i saw the early black and white ones oh this was a pretty good show when it started you know it just was kind of uh you know right. you know yeah, kind of slogging man. along after 20 years i was like you know? and that's what i remember when i was a kid uh yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't like any of that stuff. I was, really, you know, I didn't like, I didn't, I liked Roy Rogers and stuff like yeah, that. I, yeah. you know, the steeper the Western was, it seemed to be the more I liked it. Yeah. I, you know, I was a huge fan of James Garner. I, mm-hmm. I, when I was a little kid, um, my, a friend of mine was like an extra. He was Korean, uh, and he's, he was an extra on Kung Fu on the, on the pilot they were mm-hmm. shooting. And so they, you know, they, just like you put the goat in the resources stall, they always like, you can bring a little pal with you, you know. So I got to like, walk around the Warner Brothers lot, you know, Camelot Castle is, is what they were using for, like, this Kung Fu Academy, 
And all of a sudden there's this hubbub, and it's like James Garner's coming down the road. I'd seen him in Support Your Local Sheriff, which I yeah. loved. Yeah. And it was just like, you know, oh, it's James Garner. And he was like, puts his arm around me, you know, kind of tossles my hair like a kid. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> Everything oh is what I wanted to meet in a movie star, you know, this is great. So, <laughs> was he doing Rockford yet or was he it was uh, before? I'm not sure what he was up to. I'm oh, not okay. sure he could have been anything. Like this is like nineteen seventy yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, that's free Rockford. Yeah, he, he, but it's, yeah. it's free Disney. He did a couple of Disney films that didn't do very well, and they aren't very good, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Uh, no, I like this, the the Pink Jungle. There was like some stupid one with uh, George Kennedy in it. But, yeah. uh, but I, I like that. No, I was you know I was a fan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was just like it was such a you know, it was like he was so great. Uh, later on, I, I got to interview Rita Moreno, and she came down to uh, to San Jose to get an award at Cinequest. Yeah, and and I was, I was asking her about Marlowe because she was in that. Yeah, he has a great line. He goes, uh, "Dolores, huh? Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, to suffer, right? Well, you sure picked a nice place to suffer." Yeah. <laughs> she goes, oh, yeah. "He was just like he was on screen." You know, like <laughs> You know what he might have been doing when you met him is uh, he had a brief series called Nichols, which didn't last very well, not very long. I think I think it lasted like a season, and it's kind of a hybrid of Maverick and Rockford Files. It wasn't kind of like, you know, you know, he was kind of he wasn't really a cowboy, but he wasn't really like the snarky character he kind of became on Rockford. So it didn't really work. I've seen like one or two episodes. Do you, do you remember Channel Twenty? They had the TV Twenty Time Machine. I think they showed one on there once. <laughs> I was like, oh, so that's what that show's about. Yeah. But, you know, my friend Mike Monahan's been, uh, been watching. <laughs> Excuse uh, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's been he's been watching Mavericks, and he says that he loves them. He says they're very good, yeah. really well built. It's a chess player type show. It's you know, the older you get, the more you like. You, you like people that can finesse stuff, as yeah. opposed to going just just like guns blazing and bruising and stuff like that. People, that's that's why we love the Doctor after all these years, you know, because yeah, yeah he just has he doesn't have a weapon. He's got a screwdriver and a business card. You know? <laughs> But, you know, I, I'm with you. It's like, when I was a kid, I didn't like Westerns that much, unless it was a comedy. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned Apple Dumpling Gang, but that was because, hey, Tim Conway, Don Knotts. And I wanted right. to see Blazing Saddles when it first came out, and my dad said no. <laughs> he said, you're a oh. little too young. And I was seven when it came out, so I said, okay. And then I finally saw it when I was 12, when they had a reissue with that with Young Frankenstein. And so I go, hey, this is cool. <laughs> you know. But uh, I was never into the straight Westerns until a long time later. Later. And now, you know, I really admire, you know, even when they do new ones, you know, if uh, the Coen brothers do one, you know, I admire yeah. the technique and the style, even if it's not historically authentic sometimes. Right. It's like, you know, I get it now, you know, but it's like, you know, I poo pooed it for so long. That was the genre I hated. So it's like. Yeah, it's, no, it's a funny thing. You know, I used to stay out in Oklahoma with my grandparents, and uh, my, my, you know, my grandfather, he, he loved Westerns, he loved the Duke. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he had uh, he had good taste in him. He uh, I remember that run of the era with Sam Fuller came on TV. He goes, "Oh, we need to see this one," you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, we could get him out to a drive-in or something like that. So we ended up seeing like some Lee Van Cleef thing. We saw. Yeah. Um, uh, there's this one. I, I, I I'll never forget this. I'll do like a dying day regret. We're we're going by the uh, the, the drive-in in Kickapoo Spur in Shawnee and. I thought for once I'm not going to go. Let's go to the movies. Let's go to the movies. You know, like I always did. You had a big pain in the butt. Um, and and it was like dollar night. It was Wednesday, and they were going to show the Alamo. Mm -hmm. And and I'm like going that. And later on, I mentioned it. And he goes, "Oh, you should have said something. We would have gone." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't. It was weird when I was out when I was out in Oklahoma. I liked seeing westerns more, a little bit more. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they they weren't uh, they weren't. No, it's just like I said, I got locked up. Now I just love him. The Vistas, you know. Yeah. And I was a huge Randolph Scott fan. I wish I'd seen him before. Yeah, we, we saw Blazing Saddles, my mom and I, the, like, day it came out, pretty much. Right. And I, I just didn't get a lot of the jokes. It's yeah. the same problem with, Son of, with, with Young Frankenstein if you don't see Son of Frankenstein first. You know? Right. And I saw that one a long time later. It's funny. I had seen Bride in the original uh, Karloff one, and uh, for, and for years I just thought Inspector Kemp was just a made up thing. And then I go, there he is. He's in Son of Frankenstein. Yeah. All in Son of Frankenstein, <laughs> right? Exactly. Like you know, Gene Wilder's trying to be Basil Rathbone. He's not trying to be Colin Clive. It's it, it's it, you know, it was, they shook me a little. I didn't. I didn't. You know. I mean, of course, I laughed and everything, but right. I just didn't, I didn't get. I didn't understand. It's, it's kind of a point by point 
version of Son of Frankenstein. <laughs> Amazing that one came out in '39. Part of that, you know, that's more evidence of that of 1939 being this peak year. You know. Yeah. But that, that's what I noticed on, on horror movies. Is like a lot of times they'd put out the they'd put out the original or maybe the first sequel, but then you never hear about the other ones. Like um, uh, the other one that kind of floored me is uh, I was reading a Famous Monsters or something, uh, and they said there was a third creature from the Black Lagoon. The creature was, yes. walks among us, and I was like, yes. "How do you see this? You know, where do you see this? I didn't know there was yeah. this one. I mean, it's not the greatest film, but it's like for years I wanted to see it." Because it's like I had seen the other two a zillion times, you know. And it's like, <laughs> it, it, it is good. It's like uh, you know, it, it's it's very tragic. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, finally with home video, where they decided to you know put you know big uh, sets together of you know oh, yeah. all the movies, I was like, hey, now I finally get to see this stuff. <laughs> yeah, the whole the whole mess is there. I got that universal uh, universal set. I haven't even watched it all. I'm waiting for like you know a rainy day or something. <laughs> Yeah. You, remember, you remember how it was in those, those days. It's, uh, I mean, it, it's such a, it, it's sort of magic that we have just everything before us. We can, or at least, maybe not everything before us, but we can learn about everything. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and also, you know, mostly access it. But back then, it was like a matter. You'd be reading just like, like lists, you know, that, like Mike's, my friend Mike says, is you know, we'd always end with like good of its kind, you know, these little paragraphs that would describe what's going on in a different film. Yeah. And you go through the catalog. I mean, it was it was real revelation when the Psychotronic Encyclopedia film came out, and there was just like so many movies I'd never heard of that were just each one sounded crazier than the one before. And like, oh, I've got to see this, you know? Right. And the best you could muster is, like I said, Famous Monsters or any of those type of magazines where right. they show a photo from it and go, "Oh, at least I got to see a photo from it." <laughs> it was like, yeah. you know, it was some, just... some berserk Basil Gogo picture of like some monster, and you're like, "Oh my god!" I, I think that you know. Mr. Sardonicus must be too terrifying to watch. <laughs> Look at this picture. How could you, how could your heart survive this? This is going to be, you know, you would go, I'm sure people have been driven streaking insane from screenings of Mr. Sardonicus. Yes. His face. <laughs> <laughs> that one I happened to see on television. So that one was, you know, in it, I, 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 but it did kind of freak me out because I was pretty young when it came. It's freaky. You know, it, it, this was early to mid 70s. I forgot where I saw it. It might have been Channel 2. I don't know. But it's like they showed it. And and, you know, I didn't know. I, like everyone else, thought, you know, did they really always vote for him to die? Did they ever vote for him to live? <laughs> this is a question that John Waters has put up. Yeah, like, he's, yeah. He's going like, you know, where's, where's the AFI when you need him, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> find him yeah, restore it's... the alternate ending where Mr. Sardonicus finds love in the form of a beautiful woman or something like that. And, yeah, and it was his yeah. book, his crackpot book, that talked about that. And, you know, he, yeah. he was the one who actually got me into Castle films. I didn't know who William Castle was. But I certainly knew his films, and he says I love William Castle more than Ed Wood, and I go, hey, that's a good statement because <laughs> you know, yeah, and it is. I do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's like, and then I, I realized that Sardonicus was one of his films, and I go, hey, that's right. Did they ever have it where people voted for him to live? I don't know, you know. It's like I never really thought about it, and then I think it was Malton or something that finally said, no, there's only one ending, blah blah blah, you know. It's like, <laughs> yeah, of course, he figured, you know, like like. Uh... I think Waters said just basically, yeah, you know, what, what do you expect? You just bank on the bloodthirstiness of the audience, you know. <laughs> no, he hasn't suffered enough. Although, I always thought the Waters could have done an ending, you know, say, you know, the the alternate en lost ending and made his own film, you know. <laughs> oh, God. It's like those ambitious guys that just, like, grew up films. You put it on YouTube and, you know, like, except when you need actors that, or that you're claiming it's a restaging or something like that. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> put a paper bag over the, the guy's head and draw this like hideous face on it and claim it. You know, <laughs> didn't really have. I didn't really have a budget to show the, the hideous visage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, it did have like. I mean, hideous disfigurement was. I mean, movies with hideous disfigurement was something that uh, I was really big on because it was my most dreaded fear that I was not just going to be like a weird, you know, chatterbox reject, but that I was going to actually also be like coming like, him. Just like hideously disfigured, I was so afraid of that. <laughs> and 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 so any movie that had that in there, I was I was all over it. Especially if they did it so that there's just like the big reveal at the end. You know, you don't show the monster till the end. Yeah. But, but then again, I mean, like you know, Doctor Fives. I was was a huge fan of Doctor Fives. Saw both of 
because of this. Yeah. Going back to Sardonicus, actually the thing that freaked me out, which probably most people don't even think about, is the character got lockjaw at the end, you know, and I said, can you get lockjaw? Is that a whole, you know, it's like more yeah. disease, more diseases oh, God, to yeah. worry about. Oh. No, you know. Like, they, yeah, they, were, they, they had like a, a public service ad, you probably find it on YouTube, with these little animated characters like pantomiming the effects of different diseases that you can get if you don't get a shot. Yeah. And one of them, one of them was like, yeah, lockjaw, this guy's going, and it's, ah! you know. <laughs> yeah, I was very afraid. Yeah. I was terribly afraid of lockjaw. I can't eat, I can't eat anything. I'm going to starve to death and you can't stop me, you know. So terrified. Of it. And there's like some, there's a, I guess there's a movie based on a Stephen Crane story called uh, Face of Fire, mm -hmm. Stuart Whitman. And I, I would just thought, oh, I wish this was on the late show so I could watch this. So, <laughs> oh, but he's hideously disfigured. <gasps> yes. Oh, I can't. I would just look between my fingers. It's a big reveal. So now you want to see my face, do you? Now you want to see it. And I'd be like, ah! Yeah, I was such a sucker for that stuff. I mean, right. it, it didn't matter how... It didn't matter how bad it was. So you, you've seen film, so you've seen films for a zillion years, of course, and it's like. Uh, yeah. But was there until recent times, maybe, or even now, is there like an elusive film that you have been dying to see, and for some reason, you know, oh, you can wow. even say because it got destroyed in a fire or something, you know. But anything that you really you're dying to see over the years here. Um, well, I mean, uh, I guess I'm like anybody else. When you're talking about stuff that's that's destroyed or presumed missing, I'd like to see uh, Four Devils by uh, by Murnau. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they could bring that back, um, you know, I, of course, London After Midnight is probably not good, but you know, <laughs> I know they have like enough of it to show you that it's not that good. Yeah. That it's just like some great makeup, but it's got a cop out ending. <laughs> uh, with, with, um, there's, there's, the thing is, at this point, what's really bad is there's stuff that I really want to see that I just haven't gotten around to, and it's right there. That's yeah. the part that's just the worst. <laughs> and yeah. there's, there's no real incentive to see it, I suppose, because you're not writing about it. Is that correct? Or, oh, well, or not necessarily. Time. No, I mean, uh. it, it's, it's like the task at hand always like seems to to elbow aside the, the druthers, you know, especially now that I'm doing this half-time instead of full-time, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, you just have to, like, just to take care of the paper today, and then hopefully there's, like, a little bit of extra time so I can so I can look at something that I've just been lying to see forever and I've never gotten around to it. Yeah. I got, uh, I went to a book sale the other day, and I got a copy of um, Seventh Heaven with Janet, uh, gosh, what's her name, Janet Gaynor? Yeah, Janet Gaynor. Mm. <laughs> and uh, that's something I've never seen, mm. you know? And, uh but, so, so I mean, I don't know how long it's going to take me to be able to sit down with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a problem with the plethora of effect, you know, just... Yeah. Well, I have this problem. I, I, well, like, you might watch TV like I do, too. It's like I, yeah. I also am into old classic TV, and so I took it right. upon myself. Well, I don't want to see just, like the smattering of episodes of Andy Griffith's show or something. I want yeah. to see all of them. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I'm do. literally doing, like, little mini binges right now. I, uh, I, I switch off but right now. Um, I'm going through, like, Twilight Zone, and there's a few I haven't seen, and it's like, I thought I'd seen all of these things, you know, it's like... Oh, that's so satisfactory when you realize, <laughs> you know, these are, like, things you haven't seen. And, of course, they're yeah. uncut, so even if I have yeah. seen it, I go, well, I don't remember all this footage, you know, whatever, you know, yeah. so... So, I'm going through shows that I have seen i'm even watching i love lucy and you know i i oh, finished so many you know it shows i never watched as a kid but you, you know our mutual friend lee hester he's a big yeah. sergeant bilko fan and he says i love sergeant bilko and i never really saw it as a kid i mean i knew who phil silvers was and everything like that oh yeah and then now they're all available and so i said i gotta watch this thing and it's like i started watching it it took me a while but i saw all four seasons and it's like wow this is a great show the last season's a little weak but you know, hey you know it's like i could see why they're wrapping it up for that reason, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, it was like a, you know, actually you're saying about the stuff that, you know, that I might not have liked so much. Yeah, it was not, because my father was like a huge service comedy, I would go to anything. <laughs> what did you do in the war, Daddy? Uh, you know, um, Secret War of Harry Frigg, you know. <laughs> um, just anything like that. It's like a bunch of guys standing around the this, this set, like in, you know, in, in suntans. You know. <laughs> But you didn't like those, at least yeah, when you were a kid? Those type of service? Nah, not a fan, not a fan. I was like, I just, you know, oh, God, not another service comedy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just the only thing you really liked. Yeah, it's like not a, not a taste 
case for anything else. Not yeah. a not a very funny man. Um, <laughs> I like my mom. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what he dug. He, he loved it. He had three years in the army. He just loved oh, okay. it for some reason. So. For some reason, I do enjoy military stuff, but and I have no. And never did have any interest of in being in the military. Maybe yeah. it's because of uh, it's making fun of it. I don't know, <laughs> you know, like Gomer Pyle or something. You know, because like in real life, if Gomer did half the things he did, he'd probably be thrown in the brig and be just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just you, you kicked out. Of the... Like like Randy Quaid in uh, in the last detail. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that he was, he was up to. The same, yeah, another, another country simpleton gets, you know, 12 years for, like, filching from the, uh, <laughs> the CEO's, like, wife's favorite charity, you know, quarter jar. I, mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I, I loved all that stuff, and I do have that on my to-watch list, like McHale's Navy and all that stuff. Some of it isn't as good, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, that's, I mean, the last detail is, like, an all different league, but, I mean, yeah, yeah ordinarily yeah. I'm just not, just not that big a fan. It kind of just, yeah. I don't know. I mean, when I was a kid, I thought, yeah, well, maybe I'll go in the Navy someday or something like that, because I knew how bad my asthma was, and then the war got worse in mm-hmm. Vietnam, and I realized that I gotta, I gotta give this a wide, wide pass, you know? <laughs> so, you know, no military for me. Between that and the asthma, I mean, I never would have right. really made it past the door, basically. But, yeah. uh, you know, now I wish I'd, like, done some sailing, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like the sitting behind the desk pushing papers. That's a that's a good idea. That's I a good do job. too. Yeah, that, that would have been that would have been probably my my service to my country. Uh-huh. It, it, it's funny though because now we get the all we had the all volunteer um, army for so long, and uh, as a result, it's it it, it kind of causes a, a stalemate. It's like how to how to deal with the problem of like you know military actions and stuff like that. Everybody's afraid to like. Uh, I mean, in the days when everybody went in, yeah. there was like, you know, the, the honor of that type of stuff would have been just laughed at. I mean, when I was a kid, they, you know, everybody went in, but you sure didn't see like honor of that things everywhere, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so, and, and it, was, it was, I was just thinking, I was writing about uh, Harold and Mob the other day, mm-hmm. and um, I was kind of bugged by the stuff that I used to think was hilarious, the bit with the amputee uncle who's like, you know, wants Harold to go in and the army will make a man out of him. <laughs> And it just, it's just, it's, for me, it's like caricature. First off, because you look at that Herald and think, like, the, you know, the military's the last place. They don't need you. You're crazy, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, but also, but I thought, like, you know, this is like that Kipling thing about, you know, making mock of uniforms that guard you while you sleep is cheaper than the uniforms, and they're starvation cheap, you know? <laughs> but then I found out that the actor who plays this, this, this ABC guy was in the military. He had a bad war. He was like, um, yeah, he was in the South Pacific. Yeah. <laughs> So, but he thought it was okay, you know. <laughs> probably, probably he thought, well, I'm going after the officers, you know. Right. <laughs> so, hmm. it's a different, it's a different thing. I was an enlisted man. They were officers. They, you know, and you just don't, you don't really see that so much in, in today's military movies. Right. Here right. we go. They got another, another damn top gun coming out too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, those, are, those are movies I generally avoid. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, unless you have to write them, are, are yeah. you required to see certain things, or do you have free reign to write about? Well, have, see? Fortunately, that's the that's the upside of like uh, ever shrinking space is that um, yeah, I get to pick. That's the upside of it. So I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Don't have to bo- don't have to bother with, and I don't have to see a lot of Disney live action adaptations. <laughs> I'm real happy to be able to miss that. Um, yeah. What else? A lot of you know, there's I mean. I really like horror films a lot, and mm-hmm. um, I'm sorry I don't get to see more of them. Some of them, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm too susceptible in a lot of ways. I really yelp, you know, in the in a well-timed pop-up, like in it chapter two. There's some, there's some lovely pop-ups, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, I do like that kind of thing. And I just, you know, unfortunately, I don't get to go see every one of them. So, the, you know, I'm not really. There's probably like 500 Bloomhouse movies at this point, and I, you know, yeah. seen very few of them. <laughs> Well, I think I've cal- you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think I calculated out that they uh, time the releases so that there is a new horror movie released every week, at least that's one. About, that's not right. Yeah, yeah, that's not right. I think we may be at the end of the at the end of the cycle. Um, yeah, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't. I think they're you know they're relatively. I find them effective. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's also you know it's, it's nice to see Vera Farmiga is becoming quite the screen queen. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's got these she's like uh, Russian or something. She's got these gigantic eyes and uh, perfect for like you know mirror 
her sort of like horror and the uncanny and really getting I, I hope she gets more of a reputation as being like a, you know latter day Barbara Steele or something like that well not Barbara Steele but whoever would be walking around in a gown with a candelabra you know <laughs> right <laughs> Um, okay, before we go, I have a few questions because I figured you know, each one's going to take. So, um, have you ever? Uh, the only book I saw that you've written is the Art of Mega Mind <laughs> for Inside yeah. Editions. Is that your only book? Uh, no, I mean, like uh, I've, I've also been in um, a reader uh, called okay. the uh, Science Fiction Reader, which is the, okay. the, the Greg Rick edited. And that's, um, they did an essay on Planet of the Apes in there, and that, that, that gets assigned in school sometimes. Okay. I uh, mean, I the, the only reason I ask is because it's like you've done so many movie reviews over the years. Is there a chance of doing, like, a Roger Ebert or oh, a Leonard yeah. Malton type book that, that's you know... Exactly, people... That's exactly what I'm working on right oh, okay. now. And, and right. hopefully it'll be Very ready good. by Thanksgiving. It's going to be just like the first half of a two volumes thing. And it's called uh, Shooting the Survivors. <laughs> Self-publishing. And, uh, yeah, we're going to... We're going to have a rollout um, with a cinema club in November, and I think we're going to show, we're going to show used cars, 1980. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's going to take a little bit of finessing because there's some like gratuitous stuff in there that may like cause a walkout. But um, <laughs> but I think it's a great political satire in addition to being like one you know like Preston Sturges worthy stuff in there that mm-hmm. goes on. So, um, but yeah, so I'm going to do that, and I'm doing it in two parts, and the first part's coming out this, this fall, and I've been working on this for a few years, actually, so. Okay, very good, yeah, because I was kind of shocked. I said, oh, certainly he's written more books than this I one. I wish I had, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I tried over the years, I tried to sell some, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I saw this Donald Westlake quote that I like, you know, Donald Westlake, that mystery writer, he said that, uh, you know, the publishing industry is the only industry that admits its incompetence up front. You'll be bringing a manuscript, and they go, "I have no idea how to sell this." Yes. <laughs> yes. But, but there, there, have been, there have been things we've tried to tried to work on over the years. Um, me and Mike Monahan are going to do a, a, a book called "The Second Best Secret Agents in the Whole Wide World." We got some meetings, and it just didn't come to anything. Mm-hmm. Just about the spy craze, but mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, I want to get this, this these two collections done. Mm-hmm. And then I can maybe work on something else, you know. Okay. Retirement's oh, no. around the corner, so. Now, in the book I mentioned, The Art of Megamind, was that just a work for hire thing, or do you actually mm-hmm. really enjoy that film? So? Uh, I'll tell you, I, it was work for hire, but I did enjoy it. I, okay. Um, okay. It was back in the days when um, when DreamWorks had their office in, in Redwood City. Okay. And uh, everybody was very generous with their time. I got to, like, uh, go and, and talk to the animators, and I learned a little bit about how this stuff was done. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, it was it's just it's just crazy how these God, I mean, it's the development hell on a on an animated film uh, is yeah. like is like thrice the the trouble um, that goes on in in like a live action movie. Yes. They go through so many changes, and then people walk; they're unhappy. Uh, it's just it's really just just a beast that turns into a different beast, and then grows horns like a giraffe and turns into a different beast, and it's. That's amazing how hard how work it is. And, and plus, I'll tell you, um, you know, it came out the same time as Despicable Me, and Despicable Me totally ate Mega Minds lunch. Just yeah, utterly. Yeah. I actually, I, I actually enjoyed both films. I was just curious in your yeah. take on it, but you know, if yeah. there, it was a pet project. Oh, I got to do a book on Mega Mind, but I've noticed other uh, books. It was, work for, it was work for hire, yeah, but yeah. Uh, but it was actually, I, but I and uh, uh, there was some hoop jumpage that I wasn't as keen on mm. uh, when I was doing it. But uh, but I'm, I'm happy with it, and I you know um, I I do like Mega Mind. I thought it had a lot of soul, and I'm I'm sorry it didn't get as much attention as Despicable Me. Right, right. Especially you know, those, I, I every time I see those those damn minions, I kind of like ah, oh, you little yellow <laughs> devil, you the guys that eat Mega Mind's lunch, and they're everywhere. So I get to see them, and I go ah, oh, those damn minions. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of I just try not to sour grapes it too much, but yeah. I see them and I kind of curse under my breath. Right. <laughs> Well, it is kind of funny that two b- movies of similar, but I mean, I mean that's happened many times in history. But it just you know that one is yeah. a hit and one's a flop, and they're not that bad. You know, they're not indistinguishable. They, they're uh, both good movies. You know, it's like to a point. There's, you know? a, lot, there's a lot going on. I think Farrell was, was very funny, and you know, Matt Damon's good. It was it was. Uh... No, I was, uh, I was. I wish it had performed better. I wish it had been more of a hit. But right. uh, oh, you know, there's a scene in the uh, in the library when he's in the library uh, in disguise, Megamind. You know, when he's like got his image shifter, mm-hmm. you can see the books on the cart, and one of them is the Art of Megamind. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's funny. <laughs> I'll have to it look at that funny. again. I, I because I don't remember if I knew about the book ahead of time, but it, at the time you did that, I think they hadn't been covering every movie. Now they do the art of, you know, fill in the blank yeah. every animated film. That was one of the earlier ones, if I remember correctly. You know. uh, it was Insight. Insight was doing that sort of thing, and uh, yeah. Then my editor moved to Nashville, uh, mm-hmm. Jake Gurley. I would. Uh, we were we were trying to get some some more work. Uh, I forget what I was like a semi finalist for something, final four for some yeah. other project. And it was uh, it might have, it might have even been Pixar. I was like going, oh boy, I really 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 want to do this, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it didn't come to pass. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but I know I know you know we mentioned Jerry Beck. He's done it. He's done a couple uh, of them. He did the oh, Peabody yeah. and Sherman well, yeah. one and. Uh, Christ, he's, he's He's brilliant. You know, I've, got Fer- his, I've got his book right here on the uh, the Warner Brothers cartoon. Right, which, and then Andrew yeah. Farago did a couple of them. I think you, you know two uh-huh. or three of them, and he's at the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco and stuff. Like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He's doing the he's doing the Batman book. I don't know if it's out yet. For uh, I'm not sure, it, it's, it's pretty close to being done. Publishers, yeah. up there in San in San Rafael. Yeah, they were good people. Yeah, I was well treated by them. Mm-hmm. And he also did a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles book. He, he did a Looney oh, Tunes book too, and uh, he did a book on '80s cartoons. I helped him out with. Oh, like great! That, so, <laughs> so. What, what are you doing? What are you? What's your next book? What are you? What, what's uh, my next now? book? Okay, uh, let's see. The Chipmunks book came out earlier this year, and I have yeah. three that are in various stages of completion, and so I'm not taking on any more. Uh, until they're done, because I've never had so many just outstanding projects all at once. Uh, so I have a, a Warren Kramer book that's with cooperation with the Kramer family. And if you don't know who he is, he drew most of the Casper and Richie Rich stuff over the years. Oh, oh, great. Okay. And, but he did a lot of other stuff. See, a lot of people only think, if they know who he is, they think that's all he did. But no, he did pulp drawings. He did superhero stuff. He did everything, you know. And he's actually, he did the horror stuff at Harvey and stuff like that. Oh, uh, but, you know, a lot of people don't think he, you know, he, he's an artist that should be regarded like Carl Barks is for Donald Duck or wow. uh, Dan DiCarlo is for Archie. You know, he just doesn't have the recognition. And it's like, it's a shame because, you know, he He's he's was was a really excellent artist, so you know. But because it was connected to Casper and Richie Rich, oh, that's kid stuff, you know. Nobody cares, you know. Right, I know it's, it's a it's a thing about <laughs> that, but uh, it's, it's good that you're di- you're doing all this stuff. I, have, you, have you ever been to Columbus, to Ohio, to see a big you know collection of newspaper strips and stuff there? No, I should get out there. I have never been to I Ohio at all. That. So it's, oh, okay. I've been to most of the southern states and to New York and a couple other northern states, but mostly the South and you know California, everything else. But you know, one of these days. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then I'm working on a second. It, all these are actually written. It's just the, you know in various stages of completion. Uh, right. the second monkeys book with Michael Ventrella. Uh, we oh, did terrific. we we did one about the monkeys. It was our reviews of all their songs. And then the right. publisher wanted a second book, and we were trying to, we were hitting oh, our terrific. heads trying to figure out how to do a second book. And so we decided to really delve into their solo careers because nobody ever does. You know they no. they talk about that two year period. They're the monkeys and then somebody might say oh yeah they reunited you know and that's yeah. about it but it's like i talk in this book we talk about uh you know mickey's directoral career and oh, mike's subject, yeah. mike's businesses you know he's had over the years and uh you know he handled the pbs uh, library for a while and things like that you know uh davy was into uh uh, being a jockey at times, you know, and he got injured. Well, and you know. and uh, Peter, you know, he kind of went able, you know, MIA for a while there, you know, in the 70s, and then he kind of came back as a folk singer and made uh, appearances on really bizarre shows like the Uncle Floyd show and did an early appearance on Letterman and stuff like that. And so, you know, they all had their own diverse careers, but it's like they kept working, and, you know, and and so it's just discussing all that in detail rather than just say, oh, yeah, yeah, they they were they broke apart and then they got together again. The end, you know. <laughs> so no, there's there's a lot of I mean like the stuff that you know writing about the, the Pacific. What is it called? Pacific Arts was the name of the the, uh, the little studio that uh, yeah that yeah. Smith had going. Yeah, and uh, that that Nick Danger movie that the Fireside Theater did. And yeah. Elephant Park. I mean, they, he actually had three different companies over the years. He had a country. Countryside was an early label that flopped, and then he did the Pacific Arts, and then now he has Video Ranch, and he does things online and stuff like that. So he's very active, you know, uh, to this like day. Your subject so. is right there, just like you know, after aftermath of the monkeys. Right. What happened? What happened next? Mm-hmm. 
So, uh, and Scott Shaw's doing the cover on that one, too. He did the cover on the other Monkey's book. So uh, it's basically written, but we're always updating it because some new piece of information comes through, and, of course, they're still active, so we have to keep it as current as we can do it. Right, exactly. And then the third book uh, is a Total Television Scrapbook, which I always kind of wanted to update my Total Television book with Underdog and everything, but the reason I never did... uh, is because I said, well, why not just do another book? <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, this book, there's a couple errors in my, as in all my books, <laughs> um, yeah. in my original book that I do devote like a page to saying, well, this was wrong, this was wrong, this is, this is the correct answer, and then uh, I, it's a scrapbook, so it's it has a lot more full page artwork reproductions from oh, storyboards, from comic book stories, and things like that. And what I am happiest about is um, Victoria Biggers, who is the daughter of the late, now late Buck Biggers, she discovered a scrapbook when she was going through his stuff that he never discussed with me, and it has, like, pages and pages of just archival stuff about total television and everything like that so we're going to reproduce all that and she's writing about it and uh there's this other guy i know named bill smith who contributed to it too that uh he was and is a a major player with those uh, macy's uh balloons you know for Mm -hmm. thanksgiving parade and so he knew the whole history of the underdog balloon and oh that's fantastic oh that's great i'd love to know something about that so, hey, hey, do you know offhand you did the clarinet solo in the in the, in the outro credits on Underdog? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's a question that's all right. <laughs> cool. Um, hmm. I'm trying it's to think. A, it's, it's a good solo. It's like, uh, it really sounded like somebody that was like a devotee of Lenny Goodman. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Um, nice. That was probably yeah, recorded in New York, so I'm trying to think. Yeah, no doubt. Ben Stern no might doubt. know Howard Stern's son, uh, father. You know. Oh. oh, what do you know? Because <laughs> he did the recordings yeah. on those things, but I don't know if that was recorded in the studio. I never got in touch with Ben Stern. I did get on Howard Stern show once to briefly wow. plug the book way back when, and uh, you know that was the extent of it. But uh, you can always yeah. tell the cartoons with the, the New York music as opposed to the ones that was. Done out west, right? I mean, and just like you know, I mean, as, as much as I love like uh, Hoyt, Hoyt Curtin, as much as I love him, and I yeah. do love him, but the, the stuff that that was like really like like the under the underdog music, and uh, the guy that did all the uh, the themes for the Spider Man show, yeah, all extremely evocative New York. There's like a whole hour and a half of that on YouTube, and it's um, I guess the guy was I don't know what his name was, but he was an he was a musical arranger for Billy Holiday, yeah. Before he went in and just did all that that Spider Man Q music, <laughs> and uh, here's a shock and surprise for you. But I I don't know wh- what would be recorded, what and where is a lot of stuff was recorded in Mexico City too. So because they animated stuff down there, and they well, had to record Rocky and Bullwinkle. Yeah, and so it was at that yeah. Gamma Productions that they recorded yeah. some of the music cues. Uh, so I mean that person could have been recording the underdog queue down there for all i know it was all, and then it was all shipped to new york so oh is that right they were, they were doing underdog at gamma too yep oh so, what do you know so I knew, yeah because i knew rocky and bullwinkle was there right? yeah they were doing that. yeah the, the the short story on that is uh, jay ward was doing stuff it, uh, originally was being animated by this company called valmar and then they changed their name to gamma uh, General Mills is kind of upset with Jay Ward because he's doing all this stuff about spies and Russian espionage and right. stuff. It's like, why do kids want to know about this? We just want to sell breakfast cereal here. You know, can't we do something similar? Is simpler, you know? <laughs> and so uh, that's when he got the guys, you know, the guys that worked uh, uh, for Underdog and everything all worked for the ad agency. And so they pulled him out of there and they started their own studio and, you know, the rest is history. But they... They made King Leonardo, and then they did uh, Tennessee Tuxedo, and then they did Underdog. And, you know, it was all designed to be simpler stuff. And uh, then, you know, but then Jay Ward kind of shaped up and did things like Hoppity Hooper and stuff like that. So they, you know. Which was far more bizarre than Rocky. (laughs) Yes. But uh, General Mills was more happy with that, you know, so even though it didn't. I wasn't, you know, I didn't want, I mean, I wasn't happy that. That Hoppy Huber was canceled. Yeah, I wasn't at all happy about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least at that point, I was getting to understand 
stuff that's really out there is gonna they're they're gonna kill it, you know. <laughs> it's like after like you know like getting all those wounds in life, like you know all of a sudden Batman becomes really cheap and then they kill it, you know. Yeah. And then uh, they have Mister Terrific and Captain Nice, both of which I like. And they kill both of them. Yeah. <laughs> I realize this is just this is just the way of the world with television. If right. it's interesting, if it's you know then, then they're gonna they're gonna murder it. I mean, of course, I wish they would find all that stuff and issue it. I mean, I have it on bootlegs and stuff, but I want, like, pristine copies. But it may not exist anymore. I don't know. I, I remember once I talked to Tiffany Ward directly when they used to have the Dudley Do-Right Emporium uh-huh. done in L.A. Do you remember that? Of course. Yeah. I do. And, and they uh, like a statue of Bullwinkle. Yeah. You, probably, you may have put this on Facebook, but yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, bring, they're bringing him back. So, uh, oh, cool. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, uh, I asked her once. I said, "What about Hoppity Hooper?" And she goes, "Oh, yeah. I guess we could do that." You know. And at the time, oh, classic great. media was more involved, and uh, she was saying, "Well, classic media probably has it." And then I went to classic media, and they go, "Oh, the Ward family would have that." And it's like nobody has this Hoppity Hooper, and it's like, uh, you know, it's like. <laughs> Well, I have it. They're kind of in faded prints, but I have it. We could remaster and recolor them, I guess. I don't know. So, anyway. <laughs> when it goes in the public domain. So did you, when you talked to uh, Jay Ward Starr, did you ask her if that was true about the Jay Ward you know, robot that would greet people at parties? No. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know yeah. if that's a true story or not. Yeah. yeah. I, and I never met Jay Ward himself, but he was there once when I went to the, you know, he was back in the back room, but he wouldn't come out. So I, I met his yeah. wife and I met the daughter, you know, and that's about it, you know, on different occasions when I got down to L.A. But, you know, uh, that was many, many, many years ago. So We, we may have yacked about this at one point or another, but I, uh, the story I heard is Jay Ward had what you call a flick craft, a flick craft experience, kind of like in the Maltese Falcon. Uh-huh. That uh, that he was supposedly like you know getting getting to work doing some kind of boring job in in Berkeley and then this car kind of careened off control and smashed through the window and he was almost killed and he decided that in the same way that this guy Flickcraft that Sam Spade tracks that almost gets killed by a piece of falling cornice off of a building to just like I'm walking away from this old life. Yeah. I've heard that, but I I don't know how you could prove it one way or the other. I mean, yeah, I don't either. Well, yeah. I think there's that biography issue. I mean, it's just like the chipmunks story that I talk about. You know, it's like the story that was told uh, by Ross Senior and Ross Junior is that you know he was driving around Yosemite and there's a chipmunk crossing his path and uh, it dared him to run over the chipmunk and so that's why they came up with chipmunks rather than grasshoppers or something else like that. But <laughs> I don't know how true it is, but it sounds good for a good legend story and you know but you know it, it may have it may have just been as simple but they're not going to admit this hey <laughs> disney had chip and dale let's do chipmunks hey you know but <laughs> armenians are great storytellers yes, and yes, I, I, yes. I worked with one who said that, that that adam mcgoyan you know was perfectly summed up i mean the, the kind of schrodinger's cat quality of the goyan's films uh or was 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 she thought very Armenian, you know, just yeah. this, she says that they, when they tell a fairy st- story, it's like there was and was not in the yes. beginning, so. so. you know, it's like, uh, you know, I always uh, give everyone, you know, it's like, well, how did you get your information? I go, it's based on what was told. I'm not saying yeah. it's accurate, but, you know, it's based on what was told, but I mean, there is documentation on a lot of other things, and I did fortunately find, uh, I don't know if you know the author Steve Cox. Uh, he's done various books on various uh, old TV shows like I Dream a Genie and stuff like that. But oh, okay. He actually finally discovered who the singers were that sang on the later Chipmunks wow. albums and stuff like wow. that. And, you know, wow. and gave me that information. And then I think you mentioned the Wrecking Crew earlier today. It is like, you know, they played the instrumentation on all the backing stuff. And, you know, so. Oh, it would it's be just surprised. Weird yeah. stuff that I found out. And then. Um, uh, if you've heard the one called Alvin's Orchestra, the orchestra was the same orchestra that eventually did Frank Zappa's Lumpy Gravy, and Zappa wow. gave that orchestra a name, which I can't repeat here because it's too hard to remember. <laughs> it's some lengthy, uh, it's in the book, you know, it's some lengthy name, you know, it's yeah. like, you know yeah. typical Zappa I, stuff. So <laughs> I, I was really delighted when Chipmunk Pike came out, even though they probably yeah. should have called it Chipmunk Power Pop. Yes. 
stuff up there. But that, that version of Refugee by the Chipmunks is, is yeah. uh, yeah. such a thing of beauty and a joy forever, doing the Tom Petty. Yeah. And, and even the, even though I really talk about Ross Sr., I do I do cover Chipmunk Punk in, in the last chapter and just what, what ha- kind of whatever happened to the Chipmunks, you know, and I covered the live-action movies and things like that. So I tried to bring it up to date, but not the whole book. Ma- majority of the book is about Ross Sr. and his music career and, you know, and the Chipmunks, of course. So, anyway. That was, that was tough. You, you had to go see the squeak. Well, you're probably like the only adult that didn't have a child in the theater. <laughs> I never saw any of them in the theater. Actually, I only saw the. Oh, okay. I, and I have oh, all. No. <laughs> I have all four on video, but I've only watched the first two. <laughs> so one of these days, I might see the third and fourth one. Some people will say, "Don't do it! Don't do it!" I don't know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> well, I saw the one that came out in the '90s. Actually, uh, late '80s, I guess it was. Yeah. And I, I can remember thinking it wasn't the worst thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, I mean there is yeah, some charm is. to it. I mean, the, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to badmouth the Bagdasarians because sure. at least they revitalized it and they did it their own way. Sure. Uh, the the big complaint always is you know, why don't they put out all the episodes of the Alvin Show? But there's more logistical reasons than just not wanting them out. You know, it's like oh. they don't fully own everything. There's there's uh, tie-ups with you know the animation with CBS te- wow. television with oh, okay. Capitol Records and everything and it's like Interesting. I think it's not worth their while they'd rather produce a brand new show that they own outright so you know mm. you know I get it you know so <laughs> but anyway uh, maybe well, one day we shall, we shall see it all yes. uh, like through a, through a TV class yeah. uh, darkly but, but <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, I had one last question. Was, it, it, sure. Maybe this is a brief one. It's like, uh, it said on your bio that I read, it's like you did a show called Cinema Scene. What was that about? Oh, I did that for, uh, I did that for about 10 years. Okay. Um, my partner on it was a, a fellow named Morton Marcus. He was, uh, uh, he taught, taught his film history classes in Camarillo oh. College. Okay. Yeah, I miss the guy every day. Um, very good writer, poet. Um, first, but like a uh, kind of uh, prose poet, and uh, just really sharp character. Mm. Um, and he lived down in, in Santa Cruz, and so yeah, they got me on the show, and we did we did the Ebert and Siskel thing down in Santa Cruz. Yeah. it was it was like kind of a little bit all over the uh, the Bay Area at different times. So what, what but, channel did it air on? Any of them? Or well, we were on Comcast. We were on Comcast right oh, before okay. it got sold. And then after that, we did it through Santa Cruz Community Television, and a fellow okay. named George Chow put up the money. He was a, a realtor, a developer down there. Okay. So, so yeah, we did this. I don't think there's there's a little bit of it on YouTube. Um, it's uh, yeah. It's, I mean, um, I, I really enjoyed doing that. Mm-hmm. Plus, I got to commute down to Santa Cruz where I'd gone to college and stuff. So, <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah, and I, I don't think I don't think television is a good media for me, but I did it forever. Yeah. 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 Well, I did a few public access things, so I understand yeah. what you're talking. About. Mo- mostly behind the scenes, I was usually running camera or something. But yeah, and, and I was a cable caster for a while. But uh, yeah, I, I totally understand it. And whenever they needed any assistance on, or help on any of the public access stuff, I'd be there. So you know, even on the most yeah. dreadful show, I remember there was this show, and I won't say the name just in case anybody's still alive that might be. Uh, but it was about older people and what they can do they might all have passed on by now but it was such uh-huh. a dull show and it's like oh. but i went out there and helped out anyway you know it's like i didn't want to bad mouth anybody's show you know right it's, right yeah it's, it's the golden age of public access yeah yeah stuff like that now just you'll just do it on, on youtube instead right so. exactly yeah but i, I yeah i miss i miss that i, I miss yeah. like the the eyeball the eyeball stuff you used to be able to see yeah but it's yeah, like doing this podcast. I mean, in the old days, I'd try to get it on the radio, and now it's like, hey, I can do this myself. So it's like, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm trying to interview people I know and people I don't know. But you know, it's like trying to learn more about them and make it an entertaining show, hopefully. So, well, well, well you know, I'll be sure to keep an ear out for people that are, especially you know, looking for help. And you know, you know how hard it is to get people's attention these days. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I noticed that, like, um, for example, one one thing that. Uh, Oh God! What is her name? Well, anyway, there's a movie out called Be Yourself, and the director was like really looking for you know looking for publicity to get it. It's a documentary about Alice Guy Blanche, mm-hmm. who was like the you know pioneer film. She was like she was the person that hired uh, Fouillet. I was mangling his name. 
the guy that you know responsible for those those cereals. I mean, it's basically mm-hmm. like if she was an American, she would have been the person that sent T. W. Griffith out for a pack of smokes. <laughs> so, so, and, and, and it's a really good documentary. Be yourself, and it's all about the her, uh, this this history, this lost history, and also all about all the stuff you do to try to do the research. And that was the part that really I think makes it sing, and the part that would, I think interests you. Mm-hmm. It's on Blu-ray now, and it's basically just yeah about driving around Los Angeles trying to find the right facilities that can crack a, a mildewed old videotape, mm. you know, and, and get the images <laughs> off of it, stuff like that. Wow. It's, it's really fun. If we're mm. part of our methodology of mm. going and finding relatives, ending up in some, you know, like some bitty, bitty little place in Arizona where her subject's great-grandnephew has a legion of honor that this woman won, you know, the, the mm-hmm. medal. Yeah, so I recommend that one. Well, very good. I'll take a look and see what it can find. Yeah, so if I hear people that are, like, you know, really thumping the tub. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Watch my movie. Watch my movie. Yeah. (laughs) And before I let you go, uh, obviously you're still in the Metro every week, uh, but uh, where else can we find you? Or if somebody wants to contact you, what's the best way? Do you have a website or anything? Uh, I don't have have a website going. Um, The best place, I think Facebook's a really good place to get in touch with me because I'm on it all the time. Okay. Um, and uh, I respond very quickly. And uh, let's see, MetroActive.com has a lot of material that, that's not in the paper. And if you're ever, like, trying to look up something that I wrote over the course of these, like, 35 years, um, <laughs> Bing, Bing is a better search engine than Google. Mm. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, I find all kinds of stuff that I, I can't find on Google on Bing. Just, like, type my name in the, in the title, and you should be able to find whatever my ill-considered opinion was on it. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you for being my guest today. Is there anything else? Any okay, final Mark. thoughts? Or <laughs> all right. Keep, keep watching movies. You know, it's, it's still a viable medium. Don't don't listen to that. <laughs> don't let those people tell you that cinema is dead. <laughs> all right. We'll leave it at that. I thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Have talk a good day. Later, huh? All right. You too. Bye. Thank you for listening, and thank you again, Richard Von Busack, for being my special guest. Episode number 43 will be coming soon. If you would like to comment and or be a guest on this podcast, please drop me a line at funideas.mark at gmail.com. Become a patron of Mark Arnold and Fun Ideas Productions. If everyone listening just contributed a dollar a month, that would be a tremendous help in continuing the production of my books and this podcast. Also, subscribe to my YouTube channel. The opening and closing music for the Fun Ideas podcast is provided courtesy of Andrew the Slow Poisoner Goldfarb and is used with permission. This has been the Fun Ideas podcast. This is Mark Arnold speaking. This episode is copyright 2019 Fun Ideas Productions. Thank you very much and have a good night. pills in the pink electric church the final flicker of your loom